Welcome to Online Offscript, where we discuss trending topics and all things new on the internet. I'm Sam Olmsted, Online Optimism's New Orleans Managing Director. And I'm Eliza Philo, the Digital Ads Coordinator. This week, we're talking about taking an idea from the back of a napkin to a world tour. Our guest today is Rich Collins, an Emmy Award-winning composer and musician, producer and co-star of the international hit Disney Channel series, Imagination Movers, and associate news editor at Biz New Orleans. Rich has also worked as a producer for Cox Interactive Media and the managing editor for Gambit Weekly. Thanks for joining us, Rich. How are you? I am just fine. Thank you for thanking me. Awesome. Well, I know that you've got a lot going on. You do a lot of uh, different things, music, journalism, um, live shows, everything like that. So I guess my first question is, what is the first thing that you tell people about yourself when you introduce yourself? <laughs> well, uh, if you're talking professionally, I would, I, I just always kind of joke that I've got a, a, a portfolio of things to, to do to, for my own, you know, professional satisfaction and also to keep the lights on, but it is, it is kind of a diverse portfolio of things. Yeah, absolutely. You know, in the intro, we talked about, uh, your background and, um, you know, kind of your long history of, of music and production and, and everything that you've done. Can you tell us a little bit about imagination movers and what inspired you to pursue that idea and kind of the background of that? Absolutely. So about 22 years ago, let's see what, what this is 2023. Yeah. 20, 21 years ago, uh, three friends and I around 30 years old, let's say all, most of us had little tiny kids. Um, we're at a birthday party for one of those little kids. And we're drinking a couple beers and talking about all the content that you that you see when you become a parent. Um, and uh, that conversation led us to say, you know, boy, wouldn't it be cool if somebody made like an old school TV show like we grew up on back in the day with like, you know, not not animated, but like real people. But it kind of had that Mr. Rogers Sesame Street vibe combined with the red hot chili peppers. That was that was the conversation. So. You know, <laughs> that was it. That was, that was the, there was, that was the first, um, little kernel of an idea that, and, but, uh, so what's, what's pretty amazing is that these three friends of mine, uh, Scott, Scott and Dave, you know, we've been pals for a decade. Uh, I met them all when I came here, I married a new Orleans, uh, girl and, and I've been here, I've been here about a decade at that point. So these were just my buddies that I just had f fallen in with, watched Saints together and all that kind of stuff. Well, we really quickly followed up that conversation. I think it was that same week. I don't know how, how or why, but we all got back together like on a Tuesday night. I had uh, I have a music background, so I had my acoustic guitar with us. And we started just sketching out ideas on a napkin. And literally, I'm not lying, within like 10 days of that conversation, we had – typed up, sketched out. Um, I still got some original little doodles. Uh, the entire concept for this TV show about imagination and the idea of a warehouse representing imagination and uh, infinite rooms in each room could be, you know, could uh, open up a whole other, you know, uh, adventure. Uh, we had the concept written down. We had characters sketched out and we had written like the theme song and two or three other songs. Like it just was this burst of, of just fun. We had a, we had a lot of fun doing that just right off the bat. And, uh, so that was, that was the beginning of it all is 2002. Uh, I was working in media. My buddies were, um, had one guy was an architect. Dave was an architect. Scott was a teacher. The other Scott was a firefighter, New Orleans firefighter. But we, uh, you know, we just, that became our car, like our fun thing to do. We built that idea. We ended up, <laughs> I'm condensing, but I bought a bunch of gear. We put a studio in the back of my house and uh, I learned how to use pro tools and all this stuff. Uh, and we just would get together, at, you know, after the, after dinner, after the kids were in bed and we would just crank out these songs, write, write these songs, record these songs. That was it. So um, we had the idea for a TV show. We had written a bunch of songs. I'd kind of sketched out 10 of them. Uh, they were, you know, ready to go. And somehow or another, New Orleans being New Orleans, people here are so fun about local stuff, local ideas. Uh, 
some, I think the first gig we did was at a, um, the crew of muses. It was like a float viewing party. Mm -hmm. I think Scott's friend was, you know, one of the muses people. And somehow or another, we, like we took our, took my little studio speakers and I don't know what else. And we went over there to the West Bank Mardi Gras world, <laughs> did a gig, <laughs> you know? Uh, and, um, I do remember that it was like two, that was 2003. I remember getting on the phone, driving out of the gravel parking lot. I, I was calling Scott, you know, he was with his family, his car. And I was like, you know, this, this could work, you know, this could work. This is, that was a lot of fun. Um, anyway, so that was the initial idea. We, we went, worked like crazy. Um, I skipped the part about Scott. Scott is a, uh, Scott Durbin is a very funny, um, kind of a Jim Carrey type performer. And he had had a, um, kind of a history with WYES, the, the television, the local PBS affiliate. He would do a lot of their um, promo commercials for like the beer fest and these things. Uh, he had friends over there and they just, they knew he was funny. So he was like an on-air talent. So that was kind of the, the, the foot in the door to the whole idea of doing uh, the, the visual element. Uh, anyway, so that's the origin. A couple years working really hard, playing a lot. Like we played a bunch of birthday parties. It became a thing. All the, all these, um, we did a bunch of shows at one of the private schools here and then all, all the parents would hire us, you know, just shows, 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 local festivals, French Quarter Fest, kind of like an indie band. We we're like hitting up anyone we could think of to promote the idea. We did a, we did this big junket up to New York city one week and, and, and bought a booth at toy fair, which is this kids like a family entertainment marketplace. We played on this stage up there. Uh, you know, just got, got things moving any way we could radical oversimplification that all led to uh, a, a gig at jazz fest in 2005 where uh, a friend of a friend of a friend in the industry sent two disney execs to see us in 2005 at jazz fest and we had this great show a great connection with these two executives it was the woman that ran uh, all of the uh, kids programming and then a, a, a music guy we went out to gw fins that night and schmoozed like crazy and uh you know, just kind of got that relationship moving. We had a few others that were going too. It was like multiple, like we kind of had buzz, you know, like, you, you know, you're getting buzz when I got like a cold call from a, like a Hollywood management company, like one afternoon I we had a, we had a office at this point. I was working at a, I've skipped a lot of stuff. We had a whole warehouse <laughs> full of merchandise where we, we had a mid city office full of stuff that we would sell at the gigs and, and through mail order. We kind of were a going concern at this point. But yeah, I got, you know, that's how you, I, we could always gauge when things were kind of moving for us because people just like literally show up out of the woodwork. And uh, so that was that kind of feeling. Obviously, if you know your calendar, that was the, the Disney beginning of that relationship was May of 2005, <clears throat> August, yeah. 2005, uh, 20, you well, know, 18 years ago. When was that? 18 years ago? Yeah. yeah. Uh, uh, we got wiped out. We all lived right by city park, except for the one, the one guy in the West bank who did not get flooded, but the rest of us lost our houses, our, where our business went under, like literally went underwater. Uh, all the merchandise was ruined. All the instruments were ruined. The studio was ruined, gone. But it was very interesting. We had a, uh, I apologize. I, I could literally, you could just, I could just go. No, this is, but, this but, is uh, super interesting and <laughs> obviously timely for, um, you know, what was, like just a recent anniversary too so right, right so here we are 18 years ago and uh uh so i remember this very clearly we had cell phones i think mom was a flip phone but i never texted i didn't know what that was it was still when you had like you had to hit like the a three times or no you had to hit the one three times to get the letter c or whatever yeah it wasn't even I, right so i i'd gone up with my family i was ended up in jackson i was near Millsaps. And just like this little hotel where they were feeding us, like they were so nice, giving us free hot dogs and stuff, the, all these refugees. And uh, I saw on the TV, I saw my neighborhood was underwater, but I saw the, the goalpost from the football stadium by my house was underneath the water. I was like, okay, I, I get the picture. Wow. But uh, we had a gig that next Saturday in Dallas, Texas at a little festival. I don't remember what it was called, but I, uh, I learned to text. And I basically sent some message along the lines of, hey, I know everyone's scattered, but if we got to live somewhere, we got two free hotel rooms for Friday and Saturday night in Dallas. Let's just go meet in Dallas. And and there was a little bit of like confusion and chaos, but everyone was like, yeah, why not? You know, so we that's it. I remember we, we borrowed instruments. We bought uh, we, we 
bought or borrowed some kind of like fake version of our wardrobe um, and just <laughs> play, played a gig in Dallas that stayed at a really excellent hotel. You know, it was booked by the venue, you know, had, you know, had, had a, a, a little safe Harbor there. Um, and, uh, but it's really that, that, that moment is kind of symbolic because really what happened was after Katrina, everybody's jobs were disrupted. Everyone's homes were gone. Um, we all had like two or three kids around that point. But we, we just kind of, as we rebuilt, we rebuilt with the project at the center of our professional life. And so um, it's this crazy blessing, silver lining kind of a situation where all the other distractions distractions were gone and we could just rebuild it all uh, uh, with, with, with this goal of getting it done. So jump ahead, we, we, we ended up getting a pilot. We shot a pilot, pilot got picked up and that's how we ended up shooting. We shot three seasons of a TV show. That TV show is, was, is broadcast in 50 something countries translated into 20 plus languages. Um, and, uh, 75 episodes, uh, it's went on the air in 2008. It remains visible to everybody on all the streaming Disney plus streaming. Uh, and we basically essentially that, that show was kind of a passport for us. We've, we've been traveling, uh, the, the world for the last 15 years, just playing shows as much as we can, you know, there's the condensed version. <laughs> I feel like that's so impressive, not only because you made it through that, but I feel like creatives in general have oftentimes struggled with bringing concept and this great idea to reality and to fruition. And I feel like you did that through one Katrina and two very long period of time. So you mentioned Katrina, but can you tell us about some other struggles that you had maybe on the business side, how you actually got it? Sure. Be? Yeah. Sure. Well, I will say, I mean, there's, there's a lot of ways I can answer that question. Um, and, uh, you know, well, one is we, when we began filming the first season, uh, it was important to us to be home to be with our families. The way we shot the show, there was, there was a strong likelihood it was going to end up being in LA. It, it, it worked out where it was that we shot it here at, at a sound stage out there in Elmwood. So we got to you know go to bed at our, in our own beds, be with our families. We just get up and work these hilarious 12, 13 hour days. Um, it was, it was super intense, super fun. But, but what was one bit of adversity and also parallel with right now is about, I don't know, eight episodes into our first season was the writer, the last writer strike. So, we were up and running, we're rolling, got the pilot, the pilot got approved, got the show, got the first season, here we go. And then it's all stopped. It stopped for, I, I, I can't, I don't remember. It was like, I feel like we were shut down for six or eight months. Um, and so that was, again, like we didn't know, is, is this it? Is it, are we gonna, is that the rug? Has it been pulled out? But um, no, it, we, we got back to it. Um, uh, so that there was one bit of uh, adversity that we, we survived. You know, we had the full, um, you know, Hollywood experience. So we've had a, yeah, problems with management, things like that. We ended up having a, a lawsuit that, uh, with, with one former manager that, you know, was settled in a, in a, in a LA courtroom 15 years ago, whatever. So we, we've seen all the, all the stuff, you know? Um, but, uh, you know, on, honestly, re really once the project was, the, the, the four of us got together and kind of, launched this thing it's really been pretty magical and the, and the funny thing is you know obviously that that period 2008 through 12 when the show was being made and being broadcast you know we won an emmy award we got nominated for another one we were going all over the place we felt like absolute rock stars you know it perseveres and so right now cr crazily enough in 2023 uh we there's a song of ours a very very silly song uh called Watermelon Meow Meow. <laughs> it, was, it was the hidden track on the first album we made post uh, Disney record deal, right? It was 2012. We made what we consider our magnum opus. It's, uh, nice. We love this record. It's called rock o -Matic. Uh, And it's, what's interesting is that um, we've got 200-ish songs. Uh, we're, we're actually making an 11th album right now. But that, uh, that album, rock o -Matic, which came out post Disney, 2012 if you if you look at our spotify like streams that that's it's chock full of of tracks from that release you know um so i think we had a lot of energy a lot of ideas still uh just 
just cranking through us. And so we, uh, anyway, but the point is this song, Watermelon Meow Meow, song, I guess it's in quotes, because it's, uh, it's like a 30 second novelty thing. Somehow or another in the last six, eight months, it, it kind of, it went, um, I don't know if this is, I sound, I sound like the oldest man in the world. It went viral. Uh, which, which, what that means for us is that um, right now, just on Spotify alone, this one track has 13 million streams in the last few months. Oh, wow. It just, it just keeps going. We get like tens of thousands a day of this one song. We, and uh, Do you know yeah. why? Well, we have a new awesome distributor that's been helping us try and do all the data to figure it out. It, I can't tell you exactly. I, there is some TikTok stuff, but uh, a, a lot of the activity is on Spotify. So I don't know if it's kids saying, hey, Alexa, play Watermelon Meow Meow. We, we don't know. <laughs> yeah. But, um, but so that's a good example of just – you know, okay, here's, we've got so much intellectual property out there, so many different things that you never know what's going to happen. And that, that's really fun. So, um, the watermelon, yeah, can, they can pull from the bank and the library and, and they just see everything that you've made and people can connect with it at different times. But what you just said kind of brings me to another side thought is, you know, you, you built this all up before really any social media came to be. Um, and then you've, You've continued to build it as tons of different platforms have gained popularity, lost popularity, um, and you know, from MySpace to TikTok, essentially. Were there any social media platforms that you really gravitated toward that you um, put your music out there on, or your videos, or anything like that that you felt like connected with people the best? Okay, there's a disclaimer. Uh, although I'm a professional, a media professional, and a journalist. Uh, within the, the within the category of promoting movers, I am the third best uh, at this. Uh, okay, uh, we have two guys that are very very savvy, and they um, you know active all day long uh, on on platforms. But uh, so th that there, there's my blanket disclaimer. But I will say our generation, our age, you know. Um, a lot of our activity, let's say 10 years ago, was was on Facebook. Right. Like when we, when we do shows, we, we would go, um, let's say we were promoting like a, a 10 dates up in the Northeast ourselves. That was the era when you could still like boost a post and you pay like a $87 and, and you get that thing thrown out to every, um, you know, person who's already liked movers or someone who, look, who matches the profile that likes movers right. uh, or whatever, you, know, you pick your parameters. Uh, it worked really well. Like there was a couple of times, probably like in that in the early mid teens, where we promoted the heck out of uh, shows and sold a lot of tickets just using really Facebook as a as a vehicle. Um, obviously, over time, you know, Facebook is is like it's a way to reach, say, our older fans. <laughs> the fans have been with us for a long time. Uh, you know, now I, I, you know, the guys that kind of within internally manage our social media absolutely use Facebook. They also use Twitter. Uh, and we're doing our best, doing our best to use Insta and uh, and TikTok. You know, there's more we can do, and and uh, and our new distributor is encouraging us to do more. <laughs> of course, yeah. <laughs> I'll say that. Um, you know, I did I did a a video just um, I just shot something real quick in my house the other day for one of my partners to post this week just to to goose something. It was me being silly with with the uh, Alexa in my house, you know. But so yeah, that went up on. I think that was on multiple platforms. I kind of want to switch gears a little bit um, because I'm just curious about how you managed to do all the stuff at the top of the podcast. We kind of ran through all of your roles. So how do you find harmony between being a producer, a co-star, a musician, not to mention a journalist, which is how I know you. Um, yeah. How do you manage to find harmony between all that and still have time to, you know, have a personal life, be a family man and stuff like that? Well, yeah, I'm glad you mentioned that. I mean, one thing it, it, to, important to mention is that I, I have five kids too. So like the, really in the hierarchy of things, that's kind of where I spend a lot of my time and energy. Um, and it's interesting because my guys are, are getting, uh, you know, I've got two graduated from college and uh, one in and two in high school. There's still lots to do, you know, there's lots of just stuff to, to help them with and work on. So you know, that's a big part of what we do. I really, really enjoy all the music and creative stuff. And to me, none of that feels like work. It never has. 
and you know, sorry to all my media uh, colleagues, but if I could be literally on a, a stage 200 nights a year <laughs> and home with my, my kids and my dog the rest of the time, that would be my dream, you know, and, that, and I, I got to do that for a number of years. But, um, but by that same token, I really do love uh, doing what we're doing right now. I, you know, as you know, I, I host a podcast for my, my job and uh, I'm curious enough that I like to meet people and, and learn about the world around me. Um, and I've also lived in New Orleans now for 30 something years. And so, uh, you know, the, the fate of the city and all of the people making decisions that affect it are, are, are important to me. So, uh, you know, there's a, there's a lot to, to really enjoy and care about when uh, on a day-to-day -day basis doing that work. You know, as far as the balance, I mean, the, the you know, just from a very practical standpoint, a lot of the, um, a lot of the music life really now is, is centered around weekends because, you know, if we're going to go, like I just played a, I don't know, I did a show, I did a private in Pennsylvania, a theater in Texas, and I've got an Ohio coming up, and it's all, it's all weekends, you know. So, um, you know, but I will say this, here's a good example of the balance between the media life and the music life. We are very, very fortunate, and we love this so much. Uh, for about a decade now, we get to go, we've been hooked up with a, it's like a USO style tour playing for families on military bases worldwide. And we've done it, we've done like the Asia side about three times, and we've done Europe about three times. And those are extended trips. So they could be 12 days, or they could be, as in the case of this last April, I was gone for basically the month of April. And Can you uh, bring any family members when you do that? <laughs> not that one. Yeah. That one is like, because of the nature of it, it's, it's like, uh, I well... I had one child who was in grad school in in uh, Spain this past oh, spring, so we did get to meet and spend a day. We got to yeah. do like uh, we had a day off, and so we had like a really fun like tourist day together. But no, it, it, the way that works, you can't. But um, but what I could bring was my laptop, <laughs> and I I literally worked every day because you know the the actual responsibility for my job might might be a travel day or literally an off day, and then the gig day it's like three hours. There's plenty of time. So, I mean, I 100% just worked. <laughs> I was like, uh, you know, typing away a story about, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, an acquisition or a, a new hire in New Orleans. And I was uh, on a tour bus driving through the uh, the Alps from uh, you oh, know, wow. into Italy. I mean, I yeah, like it was, <laughs> that, that's a good example of how it all blends. <laughs> yeah, it doesn't get much better than that. <laughs> no, that was actually really nice. Um, well, I'm curious, you know, you've got tons of stories in, in the bag. So what are the, uh, what are your favorite gigs? Tell us about one of the, the trips, gigs, you know, things that you've performed at that you love the most. I will say that, um, a, g a good one. And by the way, I apologize to anyone who's allergic to humble brags because probably everything I'm doing in this whole thing is just that. So, uh, if that's anyone's... the whole point, <laughs> we should have the podcast. I apologize. <laughs> But I am really, I am super proud of this, and I and I and I love it, and I love what we, you know, my friends and I created. And I also just want to give a shout out to all all three of those guys, and all, you know, Scott, Smitty, and Dave, their immense talents and creativity. Uh, what an unbelievable stroke of luck that we got to be friends and do this. And then also our other buddies, we have Kyle, our other, we have a, like a fifth member that goes on the road with us a lot. Uh, love to him, and uh, you know, there's a long list of people. There's a guy named Jason Ryan that helped make a lot of the music when we were doing the TV show. Um, anyway, just, you know, a lot of appreciation. But here's a fun – this is <laughs> just like three weeks ago. It was like the first weekend of August. We played uh, Lollapalooza. And this has been on our list for a long time. Um, uh, one, of, one of my bandmates has been um, – harassing our, our management for a long time to make this happen. So it happened. And, um, but what was so much fun, I think it was good that it, it, it that it was this year because, um, it was pouring down rain the whole weekend, Saturday, Sunday, it was terrible weather. It wasn't hot. That was just nice. But so the whole thing is just soaked and soggy and they have this like special like area for like performers like us. Uh, and I would say it was essentially empty for the entire weekend that we were there, except about 20 minutes before we played and about half hour after we played, because 
all the kids that were like six years old in 2008 are all in college right now. <laughs> and they, they all came. So we have, um, if you look on TikTok, it's very funny. There's all these shots from the crowd. We did our, like our absolute, our, just our standard set, which is pretty high energy. Um, and there was not one, like, well, there was basically no little kids in the audience. It was all 20 year olds and they had a blast and we had a blast. So that, that immediately we did it. We did a Saturday and Sunday show, big crowds of crazy 20 year old kids having this great nostalgic moment. We all decided, like we already put together the, um, like the marketing materials, every festival in the country, like you should get us there. Let us yeah. play at three o'clock on a medium sized stage. And all these kids that remember us, they're going to have a blast. Cause it's a, uh, you know, it's our show is special. It's not, um, it doesn't, it doesn't seem like a, a typical, um, kid show. It's more punk rock. Just mm -hmm. put it bluntly. It essentially is kind of like a punk rock show, but <laughs> for kids. Did you play watermelon yum yum? You know what? It's funny. We, 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 um, I'm sure I said what about me. I mean, but we, like, I don't know, like six months ago, like way back when, when this first started happening, we're like, we need to learn to play this song. When you hear it, you understand it's not really a song. It's like a skit, but, um, we actually figured out a way to play it and re rehearsed it. And then I, uh, we, I, no, we never played it. We probably forgot how to, whatever we did that night. I have to go find the old iPhone voice memo to find out what we did, but it was, uh, no, it's, we have, um, that's one that you asked about a favorite thing. The show that we do is like just absolutely condensed for just pure, complete entertainment, right? We've done this for 22 years. So we've got like this just power packed, guaranteed to please set that works really well at, at a big festival, outdoor, in a theater. It's just so much fun to do. Uh, so really the answer to your question is all my shows are my favorite. Um, and then, but I would say the ones when we do like a theater type show where it's an indoor to the controlled setting, we have all these fun um, visual gags and things that we can add to it that make it extra fun. Like we've got, um, uh, well, we have these leaf blowers with toilet paper on the end that we shoot this, we, we, we roll the crowd basically. Yeah. Uh, which literally, if you're two years old or a gram, 82 year old grandmother, it's going to be equally hilarious. They all love it. <laughs> So we, we do that every, you know, anytime we can, we do that bit. We've got these smoke cannons that we use with the stage fog, you know, all this fun stuff. So like a, a big theater show with good lighting, good PA and all of our gimmicks, like it's just going to be a blast. We know it. Like we have no doubt. So that, that's a lot of fun. Um, but yeah, I mean, over the years, geez, we, um, the biggest, the most tickets we ever sold in the day, like at a, um, you know, not a festival show, but a hard ticket, like you pay, you buy a ticket to see us. I think we sold, we, we played to 7,000 people in uh, Chicago at, 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 a, uh, at a theater outside of Chicago. That was our best moment there. That was probably 2011 when, when we, um, we ended up on the cover of Polestar Magazine, which is the big touring industry uh, trade publication. Because we were like, uh, I think we were number 70 something biggest tour of the year <laughs> or something awesome. Anyway, it was just so many. We played Dubai one time. We got flown over to oh, play this wild. massive theater in like a huge, like a, like a multi-purpose, like, you know, it's probably, there's probably, actually there's probably that, that there was thousands and thousands of people there. And that was interesting because it was the only time we ever did a show. Like um, at that point, it was the only time we played in the Middle East and we drew people from all over the place. There's people from South Africa. There's people from Iraq. There was people from, like, uh, well, like all over Europe too. It was, it was a crazy show. It was like this crazy, uh, gathering of people that, it, that you know, wanted to, wanted to see us do our thing. I, I love that you could, you could play to the, the people that are in their early twenties. Now they're tapping into the nostalgia of like, of when they were kids. I mean, I think that that is so impactful when I see artists, um, and you just remind yourself of a certain time that you heard them. Um, I don't remember anyone when I was six or seven, but like when I was 11 <laughs> or 12 or anything like that, like, absolutely. What was the first was concert you saw? Fun. First concert that I saw was the Red Hot Chili Peppers, actually. No way. Yeah, yeah. What, what year, what roundabout? It was, I would say maybe like 2006-ish. Okay, so like um, prime, prime comeback years. Yeah, yeah. Um, and 
it was at a festival. I forgot what. It wasn't here. It wasn't at Voodoo in no, New Orleans. No, it was in Washington, D.C., where I grew up. Yeah, that's um, right. We have the same hometown. I forgot that. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, it's it's just so fun. And then you just like reconnect with it. And everyone around you is sort of in the same similar nostalgia vibe. And I think that that's an awesome way to kind of keep that alive, too. I always crack up when I see like young kids be nostalgic, like 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 <laughs> yeah. a second grader, like they say something oh, nostalgic. Back in pre-K, oh, man. <laughs> yeah, man. Although I distinctly remember when I was when I was like in grade school, like young, I remember being like, "Gosh, those days before I turned six, when you just could do whatever you wanted all day long. Those were the oh, days." You know? no. I do remember when you know every age you are, you're you're the oldest you've ever been. So you know you're so mature and i was i remember being in fifth grade being like i can't believe i was in third grade like, <laughs> like those guys like no way a little scrappy yeah. third graders <laughs> um, I, uh, I have to ask what was your first uh, concert uh, mine was and this kind of ties into this mine was somewhat embarrassingly one direction one direction. Why are you so embarrassed? Well, because, you know, it's One Direction. And compared to the music that I listen to now, it is a far cry. However, if you play One Direction now, still love it. I would love to go to a One Direction show again. It would bring back all the memories. So kind of the same thing, you know? you got to think that uh, I know there's, I'm sure, all the drama that you would expect. But... Boy, would it be smart in the next 10 years for those guys to do a tour because they could literally make, they could probably do a Taylor Swift like billion dollar yeah, tour. Yeah, it would be insane. And I would be there three nights in a row. I would be. <laughs> I have to say, the thing about One Direction is, um, you know, compared to some of the boy bands from like from my era and, and, and around that time, I mean, some of their songs are awesome. And some of those singers are awesome. It, it, that There's some super fun One Direction tracks. Yeah, like talking about like, I mean, they weren't aimed towards children per se, but they have some like rock and roll harder tracks in there, which I think in the parlance yeah. of the young people, I say they have they have some bangers. Yeah, they do. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just gonna chime in here and say that our producer, who's behind the scenes, just let us know that hers was the Jonas Brothers. So, uh, oh, nice. now, now everyone knows that that was her first concert. <laughs> so, um, uh, so wait, we've got Red Hot Chili Peppers. Mm -hmm. One Direction, Jonas Brothers, and uh, so this what is. Was yours? I say we're going to date. Boy, am I dating myself? So I, uh, you, uh, you know where Meriwether Post Pavilion is, right in the DC yes. area. Remember? So I, I, when I was a kid, I went. With, I had three older siblings, so I would go out a lot with my older sibs to see. Like, you pay like eight dollars, right? That's when concerts for eight bucks, and you sit on the lawn at Meriwether. Um, so I can't say for sure. I'm going to skip over two that I that that are just too embarrassing to say, but. The one that I remember, the one that I really remember, was at Meriwether Post Pavilion, and it was Journey with Steve Perry, like the original, like before he had all his voice problems and all. It was probably like 1982 or something, and uh, you know, like the 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 like the peak Journey era with him, you know, singing "Don't Stop Believing" all that stuff. <laughs> it was it was good. That's awesome. Yeah, That's it was really like cool. a legendary concert to see. <laughs> it was good. I mean, it was. I, I just remember thinking like, this is just overwhelmingly cool. It's, Super cool. So yeah, but I mean, I, I saw so many shows out there in my teenage years. It was so funny how magical all that was. What do you think when you see like Taylor Swift doing this unbelievable tour and what like, what do you think about from a musician and production and logistics standpoint when you see something like that? Obviously it's like the peak of all of those things combined, but what is it like to be a musician and to know, you know, what that takes to some degree and then see that happen? What do I think when I think think about anything related to Taylor Swift? <laughs> yeah. What I think is what, what I feel is uh, extreme, extreme jealousy. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I get that for sure. Uh, uh, I mean, oh, holy crap! What a what a genius! She's yeah. I mean, she's like, got to be literally a genius in every category. I mean, yeah. just uh, you know the the the. I mean, I. She writes her own songs too. I mean, I mean the songs from the very beginning, uh, from the uh, country era, from our, you know our song that then Tim McGraw, all those cute, cute, cute songs. Uh, was it "Picture to Burn"? The whole first album was just <laughs> absolutely delightful. I, I just can't believe it. I, I can't believe she's. I, I, th I was thinking about this the other day. Oh, you know, I, here, here's a little anecdote. I remember we Movers played 
going back into plugging movers, but we played Family Gras, which is like this, um, mm-hmm. like a, you know, the, the Family Mardi Gras festival out in Jefferson Parish, out by Lakeside Mall. Uh, we've played it a bunch of times, probably like eight times, but I think the very first time was in 2008. And, um, but the same weekend we played Family Gras, Taylor Swift was playing Family Gras. Oh, it, wow. was, it was, it was the first album was out. Um, I think the only hit, I think it was, I don't know if our song was a hit. Yeah. I think our song was already a hit, oh, yeah. but, but she was the best act at Family Gras, but it was still like, can you believe she, but she, and I just, I just read something. I, I had to write something the other day about her Superdome shows and I was doing a little Googling. And if, if, if my info was correct, she drove to that show with her mom and dad from Nashville like that's, that's the level that was in 2008. Like she was still like oh, just goodness. getting started. Anyway, it, uh, unfortunately, it, uh, it got rained out her, her show. It was, she was playing Friday night. It was poured down rain. She just signed a few autographs and that was it. But, um, but, but I guess I, I think about that from here. She was in 2008, she's playing family gras and there's all these, think of all the other acts and artists that were, you know, trying to build their careers at that point. And just the, the, the amount of times she's lapped everybody at this point is just, uh, unreal especially yeah. this most recent tour because you could see it all you could see like her after that big tour back in what the 2018 2019 i could see maybe like that's enough i don't need to do it again but then to come yeah. back and just absolutely conquer the industry unbelievable and then all the the merchandising and the business and the logistics well, i did i mean that's me because the creative side the music side but then just obviously the marketing instincts and the business savvy you know and, and maybe obviously she's built an incredible team around her. I also love what she did with, um, you know, the, the screwing over the, uh, the industry palookas that took her, that you know, over. over. That's <laughs> That's so good. Yes. It's so good. Yeah. It's just all so good. But, um, anyway, so yeah, that's what I think. I think, holy crap. She's a genius. Mm-hmm. I'm wondering in this kind of a, um, optimistic, if you will, way to um, kind of wrap things up but if you were to be approached by someone who has a passion has this this idea that they really want to pursue but they're not really sure how to do it what's your advice to them as someone who's successfully done it i guess combining my personal experience as an entrepreneur and, and having that successful project and then combining that with just my job job at biz new orleans and covering business and, and entrepreneurship and all of it now i would say obviously it's you know, uh, you have to have a really good idea and you have to be good at your good idea. I mean, so you could have the greatest idea in the world, but if you're not able to execute it, then there's no point. Uh, uh, or, 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 you know, so, you, you know, if you have, if you have it, if you got the thing and you want to grow the thing, uh, I would say absolutely take advantage of all of the entrepreneurial resources that exist in our city, whether it's, you know, any of the accelerators or incubators, uh, all the all the folks in town, the nonprofit ones uh, that that are here to support ideas, um, you know, there there is a there is a growing amount of infrastructure uh, to help people uh, of, of all backgrounds build up their ideas and try and build the city up. So absolutely, take advantage of those things, uh, and um, you, you know, uh, it really just comes down to. Uh, you know, having an idea that you that you love that, that that lights a fire in you, but also having that idea happen to be also necessary and relevant in the marketplace and solve a problem, right? Yeah. And I think we, you know, we we I learned from our, our experience, you know, there was this window, it's too boring to go into right now, but there was when we did our thing, the, the industry wanted that thing, right? And and actually they don't want that thing right now. Like our thing is was like we had that one moment and by the grace of God we we, we were there, uh, you know, there's not really any live action content on for, for families anymore. Uh, well, at least on like the streamers and everything, there's not much. Um, there's some of these like YouTube guys that have insane numbers, but, uh, you know, uh, and e- even like the, the concert industry for families is kind of in a, it's at a different moment than it was. There was that moment for whatever reason, 15 years ago, people were just like ready to go out and do this and do the show, buy the merch, all that stuff, you know? So anyway, so it, you need to have the good idea. The idea has to light a fire in you, and that an idea has to be um, meaningful and relevant to the marketplace. I mean, the, but uh, you know, there is, there are, you know, whether it's Greater New Orleans Inc. or Idea Village or Propeller, or um, 
you know, Camelback Ventures. There's so many organizations right now um, that are ready to help here in town that, um, you know, don't be afraid to uh, <laughs> visit businessworlds.com and look up, uh, you know, follow, follow us every day and you'll learn more and more about those, uh, those uh, opportunities. <laughs> Um, perfect. Well, actually, on that note, I think we're kind of about ready to wrap it up. So before we do, is there anything that you want to put out there, promote, push, or lead anyone to? Imagination Movers are playing at the Abita Fall Fest on October 21st of 2023. So if if you're hearing this before that date, come and support the guys. Uh, it should be a beautiful. Last year, last year we got com- that event was completely rained out. We we went up there and sat in a tent for four hours. Uh, and then they, they the, the people, usually when we play, the people travel, you know, uh, and so like there was anyone who did that, we brought them into the tent and just hung out. It was, it was, it was just essentially a soggy tent hangout, but hopefully this year it will be redemption and beautiful. But uh, other than that, oh, please, please um, follow Imagination Movers on Spotify. Please follow Rich Collins Music on Spotify. I'm terrible at promoting myself, but I have a bunch of good songs that I love that are up there. Uh, and uh, if people would, would uh, add them to their playlist, that would be helpful. Other than that, just thanks for listening, and I appreciate you guys. Appreciate your time. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you so much for joining us, and uh, it was super fun to kind of dive into some of your stories and, and just see this whirlwind that you've been on. Thanks for joining us today. Be sure to subscribe and rate the podcast, and if there's anything you'd like to hear us discuss, reach out on Instagram, Facebook, or LinkedIn. And as always, stay optimistic.